That's it on my housekeeping notes. Let's get rolling. Aaron, over to you. All right, all right. Made sure I got Slack up and running on the slide so I can see uh, despite do not disturb that it's there. So uh, we're here, all right. Um, so yeah, my name is Aaron Erickson. I am, uh, so let me go ahead and share my uh, screen real quick um, and we will get this going. So if everybody sees a platform shoe, um, you should see a title that says your platform is a product. And if you're going to build product and actually be serious about it, you probably need a product manager. Um, so I'm Aaron. Um, I am the co-founder of a company called Orgspace. Um, we make uh, software to help uh, software leaders and software teams uh, manage your teams. Uh, so in the same way might, one might use a traditional HRIS to manage your overall organization, we build a platform to help you manage uh, your teams uh, and the configuration and their, you know, other kinds of things. Um, but today we're really going to talk about uh, some of the experience I had from back before my life, before I decided to become a co-founder of a startup, which was when uh, I was running some pretty large teams at you know my prior two companies. I was VP of Engine New Relic. I was a senior director of product at Salesforce. And in that second example, I was actually the product manager that was building a lot of our internal tooling and platform for Salesforce uh, internal developers. And so a lot of this is learnings, um, sometimes more of a confession than a lecture, uh, even of things that maybe I or my teams did wrong along the way, or in some of the things that we got right along the way. Uh, and so hopefully you can learn from some of these experiences we had at, with large scale platforms that enable developers, uh, you know, tens and thousands of developers. So one of the first things, and I think sometimes this is almost a trite uh, and obvious thing uh, to most people when they think about what a developer platform should be. And that is thinking of your developer as your customer. It seems rather obvious. We are, you know, a lot of us are going to be developers in the room. A lot of us are excited about developer platforms for a lot of different reasons. One of which is, I'm not sure how many people in the audience, and I, I know it's not zero, there's gonna be somebody that says in the audience, hey, I love configuring Kubernetes. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, and if that's you, you should maybe be a platform developer. Um, there's a whole bunch of other kinds of developers, and I am one of this other type that would much rather spend my time and much rather spend my energy developing things that, uh, in, in my case as a startup, that empower uh, my customers, things that drive revenue for my company. And if, if I'm not a platform provider, um, things that aren't that thing, you know, things that uh, you know, aren't customer facing code, aren't going to be that thing that drives value. So I love to work on platforms that take away some of the things that I don't want to worry about. I don't want to worry about uh, you know, instances on a server. I'd rather use serverless if I can, for example. Um, so getting back to the original point, and this is kind of the cardinal rule of developer platforms in my mind, is that the, the developer is your customer. Easy to say, harder to put in practice because there are a lot of countervailing forces that will make it so your developer can't be your primary customer or will dilute that ability for them to be your customer. So one of the first patterns that you'll see in a lot of organizations is when your developer isn't the customer, um, if, you, if you're not earning usage of the platform, meaning you're building something that developers would use voluntarily absent other options, uh, that they'd use voluntarily even with other options like Amazon and Google and other great cloud platforms, is that you earn their usage. The alternative to this is mandated usage. Mandated usage means you go into an engineering organization and say, well, you must use this platform whether you want to or not because it has to conform to some standard or because we just decided this is going to be what we do. Uh, whether you want to use this or not, you will use this. Um, sometimes that's necessary. I'm not gonna say it's never necessary to say things like that, but the more that you mandate usage, the more that people don't opt into using the platforms that you're looking to build, the more you're going to create resentment. Um, so that resentment, that's already bad. You're already kind of you know, burning trust with your engineering organization if you make them use something they don't want to use. Um, but more, what's worse than that, though, a lot of times, is you end up in this situation I have called shadow infrastructure. Um, so depending on the controls of the organization or depending on how much autonomy people have, uh, they will create their own infrastructure and their own platforms, the ones that they want or use other people's platforms. Uh, if you, you know, kind of create this you know, kind of mandated or 
a highly encouraged usage pattern that doesn't seek to earn their uh, trust and earn their, uh, you know, earn their customer, uh, earn them as a customer, if you will. Um, another way of putting this is there's a lot of platform product management, a lot of platform product development that comes from the standpoint of, well, I know what I want for a platform. So if I build the perfect platform, uh, everybody else will agree with me as the engineer that built the platform. I built it for me, it's great. And hopefully everybody else agrees to the choices I made. So therefore everybody else is gonna love that uh, I make you build using Basil or I make you build using Maven or uh, I made this set of choices about how a service mesh is going to work or any number of the other things that you choose when you build a platform. Um, unless you are a genius, um, and maybe you are, but most of the time, other people might have other ideas of things that are appropriate for their use case or other kinds of things that they need from their developer platform. Everything from the way they do CI tooling to the way they do you know, Kubernetes to anything in that tool chain that they may want to be to work a little bit different. Um, maybe because they have a personal preference, maybe because more likely uh, they have just a very different use case or set of constraints than you do. Uh, so you know, they might have different things that they need. Um, this is why becoming a good listener, um, if you're going to build a platform, is you know, something really important if you're going to more than just a small number of teams. Because the higher the number of teams are, uh, the more you're going to need flexibility in the platform and the more you're going to need the ability to go off the beaten path, to go off the golden path and do things like uh, what we you know, used to call back at uh, Salesforce off-roading or the ability to put in certain pieces of the solution that, that might be customized for a given uh, part of the organization. One of the things, and this gets into what we like to think about as good product management. Product management is frequently the discipline of not just deciding what goes in your product, but deciding what is not going to go in your product. And if you don't have good product management discipline, uh, you tend to build this kind of, let's just throw everything in uh, and uh, have every kind of abstraction that everybody might you know, say they need at some point. Which sounds great, right? You know, things that have lots of features, you know, at least, you know, they can do everything you might imagine. Um, the problem is if you don't have that discipline, you end up with lots of leaky abstractions. You end up with lots of uh, artificial complexity, which is, you know, in this kind of Rube Goldberg design that I'm showing here on the screen. Uh, you end up with this, you know, the leaky, you know, abstractions where maybe at one level, it's a really easy way to say, hey, I'm just gonna put this workload uh, on a Kubernetes cluster and it's some other level of abstraction. You're having to go very deep into the weeds in terms of how uh, something might work in terms of like IAM roles or things like that. Um, you're going to create this just really you know high level of cognitive load that all of your users are going to have to have because they don't know what level of abstraction they're working at. Uh, the abstractions tend to leak. Um, you start to have to do things like configure sp very specific things uh, in a thing that's you know maybe kind of higher order um, you know abstraction in the system. And so usually that's one of the things we want to try to get away from is um, having good product management discipline, meaning we're going to have a good, you know, coherent set of abstractions. So beyond that, though, right, you know, we're really talking about product management, not just necessarily design of the platform. Uh, when we talk about product management, there really are more than one, you know, kind of force of, of where requirements come from or where you know, platform needs come from. And these are things as a product manager, uh, and even if you aren't a product manager, but you're seeking to engage your, you know, kind of customer base in your organization, you're building a platform, uh, you do have to think of these all in concert um, in order to, you know, kind of make all the stakeholders, you know, served in this thing. Uh, one of which is security. Um, you, you know, one of the platform requirements on every major tech company, even, you know, most minor, you know, smaller tech companies might have is the need for uh, security standards. So, for example, you're going to have to have patching discipline for parts of the platform. You're going to have to have things that uh, enable you to manage dependencies in a reasonable way inside of the platform. Uh, all those kinds of concerns are going to you know, come up. Cost. There are a lot of companies that have very uh, tough problems with cost in terms of how they use the cloud. Uh, it's very easy to over-provision cloud uh, when you're you know, kind of moving from, especially from more of a lift and shift environment to trying to go more cloud native. Um, and in the, when you build one of these platforms, one of the reasons some organizations will build one is as part of a cost control um, you know, initiative. 
So, you know, this, the reason you might have a platform isn't to really enable developers at all. It might be to manage costs. However, if you're going to get, you know, usage the way that, you know, I explained it earlier, which is uh, usage where, you know, developers want to use this, it can't be just cost. I don't think that really inspires anybody uh, to just, you know, use the platform. So there has to be something else there. However, as you're you know, figuring out what the requirements are and you're figuring out how do you get all the stakeholders on board, uh, you want to be able to balance these things. You can't just say, well, you can have any kind of instance you want, any time you want. Um, there are some compromises that generally have to get made in the course of doing this that hopefully are in the developer's interest as well. Um, and then developer experience. Um, of course, uh, as you go through and do this, um, you know, having a great developer experience is going to be that thing that you actually get you earn the usage from. Uh, if you make developer experience really hard, if you make it so that you have to onboard onto 20 different services to get any one service running, uh, to make it so everybody has to remember all those steps, you're going to have a really, really hard time getting people to actually understand how to use it, much less want to recommend it to their colleagues, to their peers, to other parts of the organization, which is really what you need. You need that ability to have people say, oh, wow, this makes me more productive. This is a great developer experience. This is something that I want to be able to use so I can get my work done and really kind of achieve the goals of my company without having to you know, worry about Kubernetes all day, uh, as many of us, even today, um, you know, are unfortunately forced to do. Um, so let's, let's shift a little bit on this. Because um, when we think about platform design, uh, it's really easy to say, well, you know, okay, fine. We're going to design a great user experience. We're going to design a good set of abstractions. Uh, we're going to build in some cost control measures so that we don't you know, necessarily over provision cloud. And we're going to make sure we conform to certain security standards. We're never going to, you know, if you try to push something that where you have a de depend about alert or something that says you need to upgrade something, we're going to create tickets, things like that, right? There's lots of things you can do from those standpoints. But we think about what a PM does and what makes it different, why you need a product manager, they really do a different set of things than necessarily your you know, kind of standard you know, engineering staff in a typical you know, platform team. Um, one of the first things that good product managers do in the platform space, and I want to be very specific about this because this is a little bit different than your maybe product, you know, kind of more traditional product manager building you know, the actual product for your company that's not the platform. Um, is you are meeting developers, you're meeting them, understanding their pain points. One of the tricks I used to love to do back when this was my day job is I would literally sit for half of a day with engineers and really understand where are their pain points. Like the, the technique is called a Gemba walk or the idea that you li literally sit with them, have them walk you through how their build process works. Have you walk them through or have them walk you through, sorry, what deployment looks like when, you know, what is that path from when they write a line of code, what does it go through on the way to production? Really, really understand that deeply uh, so that you can understand where their pain points are, where they get delayed, where they end up having to say, hey, we're going to go do a build. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. I'm going to hope for the best later on. Uh, those kinds of things, well, it's great to have coffee, right? You know, they, they get in the way of your workflow. They get in the way of your ability to feel like you're being productive. And so, you know, one of the first things that, that is your job when you're in this pro, you know, product manager role in a platform is understand where those choke points are and understand how you can you know, resolve those and unblock people so they can kind of continually be in that state of flow as they're doing their uh, engineering work. Um, you're meeting with stakeholders in other parts of the organization. So one of the really critical things you want to be able to do as well is to say, listen, I love the ability to, you know, be able to do great developer experience. But what's really the FinOps perspective? What are the financial things that we're trying to achieve with this? And more importantly, where are the places where simplifying a developer experience may be providing a smaller number of options, a smaller number of, say, instances on AWS that you might be able to load into, but if they're the right ones, maybe there's a way that you can also achieve some of the financial objectives as well. Um, as well, there's sometimes where even the engineers in the organization, even if you're not on the FinOps team, uh, you might care deeply about the unit economics because you care about the sustainability of the product you're building, right? Um, funny enough, when you're when you're a startup founder, um, so one day sometimes I'm coding, sometimes I'm you know paying the company bills, sometimes I'm working out how much runway we have left. I have to care about all three at once. <laughs> I also have to care about my product experience at the end of the day. Um, and so I think a lot of engineers are starting to think in those terms as well. Certainly, product managers. 
uh, are going to do that uh, in the in the same capacity. Um, so that's really to kind of meet their, you know, understand the functional requirements, cross-functional requirements, security requirements, and so forth. Really, really understand those deeply and figure out where you're going to make the compromises in the building of that. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, continuously measure adoption churn uh, usage. Um, so when you have any kind of product, um, and this isn't always true in a lot of organizations that are just mandating usage. You're mandating usage. Uh, why do you care about adoption, churn, and usage, right? You're mandating usage. Adoption should be automatic and churn should be zero. Well, okay, even if you're mandating usage, there is how, how much of it are they using are this? Are they actually recommending this to other people or are they, you know, you listen, you're on the ground and you hear people complain about the platform a lot, uh, continually have issues with the platform. Or on the other hand, if you're allowing people to onboard voluntarily, are people voluntarily onboarding? Are people telling other people in Slack channels about, hey, don't you don't have to go to this more complex thing. You can use this simple thing and really, really kind of you know accelerate what you, you know your your feedback. Um, you know, you really want to understand the nuances of usage. You also want to understand, and this is a core product management principle: what features are people not using versus using? Um, and that's going to give you a really great signal to understand. And this is, goes for any product you ever build, either on top of a platform or not. Um, if you have features you built in your platform and nobody's using it, that's actually a tax on your platform. You know, every bit of code that you ever write is something that somebody has to maintain, likely at some point down the road, it increases the surface area of the system you're building. So if you have inert features or features that are fallow or not being used, um, you're going to want to either fix the feature or consider removing it, consider sunsetting it. Um, you know, Features that have no usage, sometimes those turn into security risks because nobody's really paying attention to, you know, maybe, you know, kind of how the feature is developed over time. Uh, so that's really just something really, really important to uh, understand is you think about what PMs actually do. They're constantly looking at the surface area of the platform, figuring out what's in, what's out, what's the next good direction to go based on that user feedback, based on the conversations that they're having with the teams of their organization. Uh, active developer relations. Um, you, know, you know, there's a lot of, organizations that have um, a developer relations you know, role or you know, a developer advocacy role. And there's a lot of crossover, frankly, sometimes between what a PM for a platform does and some of that developer relations work. Uh, it's not the same thing. I don't want to say it is. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that DevRel folks do that platform product managers aren't going to do. But there's a, there's a you know, kind of the intersection of those things um, is to always be building trust with your customers, uh, and those customers are primarily your developers that are using the platform, but also your other stakeholders, right? You know, your security folks, your your FinOps folks that pay the bills for this thing. They want to, you want them to see you as an advocate that is looking out for their best interests, is trying to make them more productive. And even if you can't say yes all the time, right? You know, there's going to be saying some things you have to say no to. This is, you know, every product manager has to do this. But if you're doing a good job of building that trust you've built a bank of, of an ability to say no to people, have them understand why, give them context, and so that you maintain that trust over time, even if you have to occasionally disappoint them with something you can't quite do yet. Um, and then, like I said before, you know, you're managing these trade-offs, right? You know, as you're building that trust, um, there are going to be times, and I've been in organizations where, frankly, costs mattered more than developer experience. <laughs> um, you don't want to be in that situation, but um, sometimes you might actually have to say, well, cost man you know, matters a little bit more right now, because if we don't have, if we run out of money, um, there is no company to have, right? You know, so if you can manage those trade-offs, and in the cases where it's not going to benefit a developer, even if they are your primary customer, be able to explain to them that concept, like, you know, listen, you know, we need to run on this kind of instance. We can't run on just anything we want or with a lot of extra capacity because of, reason X, Y, Z, right? You know, this will help us get to our next, you know, funding round or, you know, something like that. Um, those are all different considerations that we really want to, um, you know, think about as we're, you know, doing this role. So I, I hope I've described a lot of things that are generally useful, um, things you want to have in your organization, uh, even if you don't have a formal product manager, ideally if you do. Um, there are some objections to hiring a formal product manager, uh, and they've only gotten you know, more distinct now that you know, this year it's been a little more of a challenging uh, economic environment in some you know, tech companies. 
Um, one of them is just the, the we can't afford it reason. Um, and I've been here, right? You know, I've been in this organization, you know, I've been in these organizations um, which properly um, see product management as a nice to have. It'd be great if we could have a product manager. I've heard this a million times. We can't afford one. We don't have any extra headcount. Uh, we don't have any extra roles in the organization to support this. Um, some version of we just can't afford it. That's always a tough one. Um, I think one of the situations you're going to have, though, this work is going to get done. It is going to be done by an engineer or it's going to be done by a product manager. Um, you know, whether you want to or not, somebody's going to have to listen to customers. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be really hard to know what to build. And so, you know, even if you can't have a formal product manager, you should have somebody in the role. Uh, you know, otherwise, uh, the thing that you also can't afford is spending three months building the wrong thing. That's also very expensive. So you want to kind of consider those trade-offs uh, in these environments. Um, the version of this is, I just need engineering headcount. Um, I, I don't want to have overhead in my team. Or a, a variation of this is, there is a different organization that has product managers. And really, it's just, hey, they're not going to support this kind of product management because... Uh, they see product management strictly uh, kind of external customer facing. Okay, fine. Um, you will end up again turning one of those uh, engineering headcount into a product manager one way or the other, um, or you won't have the kind of customer feedback you need to build this thing effectively. Um, one of the things I would recommend if you can't get product management in this kind of situation is have at least one person that is a, I'll call it the product curious engineer, the product curious platform developer that uh, sometimes it might be the leader of the team, sometimes it might be just a really, um, you know, kind of somebody who's really focused on product kind of concerns, member of the team, take on at least enough of that role to um, make it at least minimally effective <laughs> so you build, you know, something as close to the right thing as possible. Um, there's a lot of cultures where that's seen as part of the engineering manager's job. And, you know, frankly, I have a lot of sympathy for this point of view, um, you know, especially even in my organization, we're a small startup, we don't have a separate product manager uh, building you know, our internal platform. Granted, we just use a serverless platform, so there's not much there. But even if we were bigger and we were doing our own, uh, we would probably lump that job into uh, part of what an engineering manager does. There's some trade-offs there, right? You know, it's a little bit more of a specialized skill set to be a product manager. Engineering managers often are more focused on career growth of their people. They're more focused on kind of the how more than the what, perhaps in terms of how things get built, um, depends on the culture of the organization, right? And a lot of them are pretty different. Uh, but uh, there's gonna be a lot of organizations where it's seen as the engineering manager's job. Um, if that is true, then at the very least, that engineering manager should be prioritizing all those other kinds of activities, uh, talking with customers in the same way that they would if they were a product manager. It just means that engineering manager is gonna have to wear more hats and they're probably gonna be a little bit busier. They're probably gonna have a lot more uh, meetings on their calendar and uh, they need to be okay with that trade-off. If that's going to be the objection. Um, another objection might be, well, we're mandating platform usage. Why do we need to worry about adoption? Okay. Um, that can work um, if you have a very excellent platform or if you have uh, engineers that don't have other options, right? You know, if you are in a situation where um, your engineers are never going to leave, uh, they're never going to say, well, I don't feel productive here, so I need to move somewhere else. Um, maybe you can get away with mandated usage. Um, but frankly, I've seen literal, you know, we'll go into this in a little more detail. Um, companies really flounder for years when they force people to use a platform that nobody wants. Uh, that becomes a major driver of unhappiness in an organization. It just hurts productivity. You get less done. Uh, and that doesn't help either. That doesn't help the finances of an organization. It doesn't help get more product features out the door doesn't really help anybody when um, you just have to mandate usage. Um, granted, there are some cases where you might say, well, you know, you know, we're in a situation we just have to mandate usage because you know, we can't, we don't have time to get everybody to agree. And if we don't get everybody to agree, we're gonna be you know, gone in six months. You know, maybe, maybe that's the thing you need to do. I would hope that can be done with some eye towards uh, understanding how you then grow out of that so that you can get to a platform that people want to use and aren't just forced uh, to use. Uh, and this is kind of one I actually, I think is actually kind of a clever objection, uh, which is platform devs are developers. Therefore, they know what they need to build. We don't need a product manager. They're, they are, you know, everybody, every platform developer is a product manager. Um, and that's one I'm 
you know, I think could be a reasonable objection, right? You know, if if the developer of the platform is very attuned to what the product developer needs, or maybe they go between those roles pretty fluidly, um, that can work actually. And I've, I've seen it work pretty well. In fact, we have one of our engineers that goes between those roles all the time. Um, I would just say they still need to be doing all the work of product management. And that's one of the key things. Are they doing that work uh, to be able to um, you know, understand um, what those needs are and be talking with customers? I mean, that's really the key thing, talking with customers, deeply understand the trade-offs. It probably needs to be a more senior engineer just in the sense of having some relationships across the organization to make them effective in that role. Um, that's something I would certainly look for in that situation. So we talk about metrics all the time. Uh, you know, we, there's, there's a lot of chatter about these ideas. Um, what metrics should you measure to understand if your software organization is effective? Um, we talk about you know cycle time, mean time to recovery, you know the the the, the gold the golden four metrics from uh, the Door Report, um, which are pretty famous. There's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, you know the, the, you can make a slide deck that's 30 pages long if you want to talk about all of them. But one of the most important metrics I find in terms of what good developer platform work enables is lower attrition. Lower attrition. Um, what there are people, when I hear good platform stories, I hear about developers that not only feel more productive, um, they get better results for their companies. They don't have to be in situations where companies are driving layoffs because they are building tools that lots of their customers want to use. They're, they can build features more quickly. They can respond to their product managers for the actual product they're building more effectively because they're not stuck in you know, multi-week uh, feedback cycles to get anything out the door because they have a platform that handles a lot of those concerns for them. Um, if your typical bit of work takes five times longer than it needs to, um, that is going to have some effect on the finances of the organization. Um, so, you know, so even if you're in a situation where, hey, we're not as worried about attrition, you know, right now the market's changed a little bit, I, I don't think that matters. I think you still have to worry about attrition. Uh, most notably, when you think about who you want to keep in your organization, uh, it's going to be those people that are bothered by not being productive. If you have engineers that are bothered by not being productive, those are the ones you want to keep. Those are the ones that are the uh, usually the most effective engineers or the ones that are driven intrinsically to create the products that your company really wants and needs to produce in order to meet the moment uh, of you know, today and tomorrow's uh, you know, features we want to build. So that's the core of my talk. I'm going to be here for uh, questions uh, and uh, you know, hopefully have some decent answers as well. But um, I'm always here if anybody wants to ask questions either in this forum or if you're just watching this YouTube uh, afterwards and uh, you're interested in this topic, I'm always here to talk about it. It's one of my favorite things. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so uh, intimately interested in this uh, platform engineering space um, as well. So thank you, and uh, we'll move to the Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. You can see, guys, how passionate he is. I, I told you in the beginning. But uh, so many great tips that you can implement tomorrow in your day-to-day -day life. So I think that's the most important one. And we have a bunch of questions uh, already. Um, Aaron, do you want me to read them out for you? And Yeah, if you can read them out, then I will. Um... Go ahead and answer them the best I can. Hopefully my answers are good. But uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Perfect. You can stop screen sharing if you want or just like go to one okay. of Okay, I will, I will stop the share. It'll make it easier for me to see faces, which is great. Sounds great. So I guess this question relates to uh, the uh, when, when you were talking about um, conducting like user uh, research of your developers, right? So uh, Gil is asking, what do you mean by pain points? Uh, is it in the product architecture or something else? Yeah, there's a lot of good examples of this. Um, one of the pain points that I've seen is that sometimes a uh, deployment process will be very slow. Okay, a very simple one is I want to be in a developer workflow where I can make a change in a, you know, in my code, I can commit that change, I can, you know, maybe get a pull request done very quickly, maybe I'm in a push to trunk environment, which is my favorite kind, but I want to be able to understand the impact of that change, you know, as quickly as I can, so I know if I need to move on and fix it or not, 
Okay, one of the pain points, and I remember, boy, it was, I'm not going to name the company because I don't want to name the guilty uh, or get in trouble, um, where I would commit a change or one of the team members would commit a change, and you wouldn't know whether it would pass tests for uh, three days. So what do you do? Uh, well, you, you commit the change, you put in a change list, you um, send it through their you know, million uh, tests, you know, a bunch of Selenium tests, a bunch of other things. And uh, you hope you don't get any bugs back um, three days later when you've forgotten everything. That to me was a significant pain point. Um, other kinds of pain points come from too many uh, steps to memorize. If there are too many things you have to onboard to all at once and too much cognitive load of uh, things you have to remember when you're setting up, say, a new service, um, that's, that's, that's a huge pain point, right? Um, to the degree where if, if you make it really hard to set up a new service, there are some really bad incentives. Notably, and one of the things I saw a lot of organizations do was inadvertently create monoliths, even if they could hypothetically do microservices, simply because the pain to create a new service was literally approvals, you know, you know spending two weeks getting approvals, getting infrastructure, spending uh, four weeks to get everything configured the right way. They would happen, but it wouldn't happen very frequently. And the system solved against being able to get those things done. And that made it just, Nearly so. What would happen is it would be much easier to build the service inside of the uh, code base you already had, inside of an already existing service. Um, and because the cost was so high to make something a new service, people just wouldn't create them very often. Those are a couple. I could do a whole talk called "Bad Pain Points of Bad Platforms." Uh, so maybe next time we'll do that. Yeah, but I'll make a note of that. <laughs> Planning for uh, for the next quarter. Uh, next question, uh, how do we decide what product is for internal development platform? Should UX be a separate product from runtime? What has been your experience? So my experience is you can actually separate those things to some degree. I've heard of people that actually are able to somewhat successfully use, say, something like Backstage.io um, with different kinds of uh, substrates under, you know, under that, that might do different things. And so that's really kind of a, one example of using a, you know, a user experience that's decoupled uh, from the rest. Um, I've seen that work. Uh, I think there's some you know, kind of sophistication in terms of how you set that up. Um, so I'd wanna look at that and I've, I've seen that be pretty successful. Um, I've seen, sometimes it's different teams that, that are gonna be setting that up as well. And maybe the user experience team you know, is more attuned to what the customer is looking for and they can kind of make what happens uh, under the scenes work really well. I have seen some problems where if those two things are say two unaligned teams where you have a user experience team that's trying to uh, drive towards, let's set up a service, you know, make it possible in a day, but there's not alignment from the team um, who's doing the kind of back end of it that would make that actually possible. I've seen a lot of conflict in those kinds of organizations as well. So I, I think it's not, a, it can be done technically. I think it depends on frankly the, um, I hate to say it, the politics of the organization and the ability of people in the organization and different layers of the stack to work together effectively is kind of how I would see that. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, another question from Kirti. Uh, how to motivate teams who are reactive in a sense from just resolving issues to, proactive, to being proactive and focus on building a product? Or do you have a separate development team for that? So in the case where I've done it the last couple of times, I had a development team. I was, you know, we worked literally with um, a team that was chartered to build a platform. And that was really important because otherwise you're going to be consistently competing for resources. So, you know, when you get to that, you know, crunch time, you're getting ready for a launch and you're making that decision. Do I work on something on the platform or do I work on something that gets this you know, next set of features out the door for some marketing launch. I mean, I know it's going to win. The marketing launch is going to win every single time. That, yes. you know, the, <laughs> the people that bring the money into the company, they, they generally tend to be pretty persuasive. Um, and spend and, money uh, as well. For good reason. I mean, now that I'm like actually a startup founder and I have to make these decisions, I have all the sympathy in the world for people that push platform teams in reactive mode if they are also doing, you know, responsibility for some of the big features. This is where it gets hard, right? You know, the, it's really easy to say always be long-term oriented. There's a time in my career I kind of just 
walk into some C-level's office and say, if you're not long-term oriented, you're a bad person. And uh, the reality is sometimes when you're in the seat and you got to deliver for shareholders, you cannot, you don't have the luxury of being long-term oriented. You're kind of going to be short-term oriented and that's going to have to be okay. Um, so boy, it's a tough one. Um, I think the best thing you can do though is try to create a structure. I mean, there's a reason we talk about, um, you know, the structure of an organization dictating, you know, what the architecture be, you know, becomes, you know, the, um, you know, so, so, you know, having that separate team at least provides people that care about that. And it's going to be maybe a little bit less likely that they get pulled up to do other things. It's not going to prove, it's not going to be a complete, you know, non-starter, right? You know, sometimes you're going to pull people from the platform team, work on product features, but um, usually have a little bit of a defense there. Yeah. If someone is a junior PM, how to get senior developers trust you? That's interesting. By the wow, um, <laughs> that's hard. I, you know, I think to some degree, just help them get things done, right? You know, I think there's actually some power in being the junior person, but that's very focused on, you know, I mean, you know. I'm, I'm going to try to be good for the kids in the room, gets, gets things done or GSD gets shit done. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, but, but, you know, we all know the term, right? Um, being very effective at just being a good listener, being able to build credibility quickly. Uh, I've seen some very, you know, first, second, third year, you know, kind of product managers do extraordinarily well in the role. Um, if they can be good listeners, if they can build credibility, um, if they can, you know, you know listen to the people that have a little more experience in the org. And most importantly, there, there's a tendency I've seen with younger people that have read a lot of the books, that have read a lot of the materials to come in and have cargo cult style answers. Um, when I say that, they, they are things, hey, I read in a book that this is how the jobs to be done framework works. And if you're not doing it exactly this way, uh, you're wrong. And uh, I'm going to you know push back on that. And I think that is a, it's kind of a mistake some of the more junior people will have because they, 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 they're very eager, they read the book. Um, I think being able to come in and be humble and understand that everything that's maybe seems broken to you when you go into this new situation, uh, maybe is there for a reason. Maybe there are some very good choices that were made that you don't have all the context around of why things might be broken. So if you come in as a new product manager and say, it's all broken. We all got to fix it all. And you have all the enthusiasm but without understanding the context of the decisions that got made. It's kind of like as engineers, right? I don't know an engineer that ever goes into an old code base and thinks the old code is terrible. I've done it a million times. And I think I'll, there's not a person in this audience that hasn't at some point in their career gone into an old code base and gone, this is crap. It's all bad. Yeah, it, it's all bad. But have sympathy for the person that came before you who um, probably was under some tight deadlines or probably was under just a different set of constraints or frankly, just a different set of knowledge, you know, now. And I think being, uh, you know, empathetic towards them and really kind of assuming good faith and understanding that they probably did the best they could at that time. And your job now is to fix it with what you know now. Um, I think those are all kind of good orientations for a young person to come in if they're a brand new product manager. Um, and that, that's kind of what helps build the trust, right? You build the trust, um, they're going to, I don't think they're going to care about how much experience you have if you're effective. Can you share that piece of advice that you uh, received, you know, that helped you grow when you were just like starting out your career? Was there something like that? I think the piece of advice I just gave was advice I wish I'd been given three years ago. Not just early in my career, late in my career. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I came from consulting and, and a lot, like I say, so these are sometimes confessions more than lectures. And mm -hmm. I came in guns a blazing. We, if we don't have a perfect test pyramid, you're wrong. I think in that talk in uh, Ukraine I did a few years ago, I think I got on a stage and said, if you're not doing perfect test pyramid, you're wrong. You're a bad person. I wish I had taken my own advice maybe a year later where I realized sometimes there's good reasons why there's not a good test pyramid. Um, sometimes there's good reason to be humble. And, and so that's one piece of advice. Um, I think as, as well, you, you know, you know, listening to, you know, being very kind of ears and eyes open to what people's pain points are and being able to 
you know, be able to get down in the weeds and help them solve those things. I think, you know, nobody's going to hate somebody that goes in and helps solve problems and just being very effective at that, but also being very, um, I don't know, just, just be a human towards them. Understand that people that came before you were um, well-intentioned. I mean, if they were wrong, they were, you know, they weren't doing, they weren't trying to do bad work. Yes. Uh, shifting gears from building uh, relationships into metrics, favorite mm -hmm. one. Uh, the question is, how do you measure attrition and uh, can you give some good references? Um, so you say measure attrition? Yes. Okay. Um, ask your HR business partner. They will tell you how to measure attrition. <laughs> That's how many <laughs> people... combo, Aaron. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, so as somebody makes a piece of software to do that, you're literally how many people, so there's actually two kinds of attrition I like to measure. One is the kind that HR will measure, which is how many people in a given year leave your organization voluntarily that you wish didn't leave. So kind of the um, you know regretted attrition percentage in a given year. Um, that's one that you want to be lower. Um, and if you're doing good platform work, um, th there's other things that will control. I mean, if you're an organization that uh, has a great platform, but pays way, way under market, there's not a lot of platform can do that's going to solve that problem, right? It's not the only metric, um, but that is one that you can use as a top line metric absent others. Um, one of the way, if you have multiple teams in an organization that have different access to different platform capabilities, I would say, look at the, um, what I call soft attrition. How often do people quit your team and leave for another team? Uh, where maybe the, the platform's better, or maybe there's other kinds of things that uh, where they feel more productive. Um, that might that's not going to be measured in the company level attrition, but you can certainly look at that at at team level uh, attrition. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, gosh, Aaron, you're on fire. We have 14 questions, so <laughs> let's sure. uh, let's, let's dive in. I'm excited. Um, general question. As a former developer myself, I perceive many developers are geniuses in finding value that should be developed, but not necessarily the best in prioritizing. Any advice that works that worked in your experience? Prioritizing. Yeah. So, so the question is um, prioritizing. Um, Hire a product manager for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, I, I've seen it really easy, and this is a mistake I made, right? Um, it, it's really easy to kind of prioritize based on the last fire you put out, the last incident you had. I mean, that's going to think about what's going to occupy, you know, what, who is paying rent in your head over whatever technical mistake was made most recently. Um, being self-aware of your own biases in terms of how you prioritize, going back to biasing towards what other people, you know, data that you gather from external sources or data that you gather from uh, working with engineers, um, seeing what the metrics are in systems, using that to prioritize is, you know, again, you can't always do it, right? You, maybe you don't have the data sources. Maybe the experience you have recently is actually pretty relevant. Maybe that's the thing you need to fix. Um, it's not always bad to be reactionary. If you're re reacting to an incident, it's good to be reactionary. <laughs> React to the incident, just don't create it again. Um, but be aware of those biases, right? You know, be aware of your cognitive, um, you know, priors, so to speak, and uh, make sure you're not over-indexing on some of that stuff. That's the best advice I have. Um, there's a whole book on how you good prioritization as a product manager, where you kind of think about what is likely to you know, create better things short term versus longer term and actually having a good portfolio of things so that you're thinking about, well, there's a few big bets that are gonna be long-term impactful. They're gonna take a long time. You might want that to be 20% of your you know, kind of set of features that you have. And maybe you want 70% to be things that you see some short-term gain from because you're trying to get support for the product. If you have nothing but long-term, um, you know, th things that fix you long-term, you're gonna run out of time to convince people to invest in it more before you get the next round of funding. So you need a mix of short-term wins that you prioritize that prove the value of the platform mixed with long-term things that are more proactive, maybe less a little bit reactive that are kind of your big bets, so to speak. Um, and then maybe let that last 10%, notice I left 10, uh, that's for experimentation of things that you don't know what they're gonna be or not. Um, that might be things that might be short, might be long-term, might be new customer feature requests that 
you're building in, maybe they're not the most important thing, but you have a stakeholder that's really important that you want to convince. Um, so you can kind of strategically decide what's going to be in that last kind of 10%. Um, but there's a whole bunch of really great um, models around how you do that prioritization. I think the, you know, the jobs to be done framework is one I like to use um, to, at the end of the day, center things around a workflow around what people are actually trying to accomplish uh, and things that aren't in that workflow um, be a little bit more skeptical for us. Yeah. Uh, I like this question. How do you decide build versus buy component for the platform? Um, always buy. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whenever somebody uses the word always, you you should walk away from that person. Or you know, maybe, okay, maybe don't do that. But like, you maybe question yourself. Um, I think you buy more often than build because most of the time your organization unless you are a Kubernetes provider, probably shouldn't be building platforms um, on average, right? And this is on average. And, and if you just take that advice and go say, okay, that's the answer, that's cargo culting, that's bad. Let's not do that. Um, if you are a very large organization, so I'll just be blunt. If I'm Salesforce, um, I am probably going to build my own because I have specific circumstances that would dictate that, um, Anything that I would bring in from the outside, I'm gonna have to customize so heavily anyway that it's probably not gonna work, right? You know, maybe it will, you know, I've been there a long time and maybe they'll be fine. But I think for those kinds of really, really big cases, you're probably gonna build your own. If for no other reason there is some economy of scale you'll get from that when you're a 50,000 person organization. Um, though that's not always the, the, the right answer there. And they could end up even buying. Um, I think if you're my company, uh, a pre-seed startup, you are never going to build this. You, you know, building your own is al is almost certainly the wrong answer because we're that's just not what our investors are paying us to build. So go buy one. There's probably one that's good enough. Go do that. Um, I think there are probably some kind of edge cases where the platform needs to be so unique because of the solution you're building. Well, say I'm building something that is a mix of hardware and software. And there's no current platform that really does that well for various reasons. Like I need to work on, build a platform that helps me build low power devices that work in, I don't know, an electric coffee mug or something. I don't know, I'm just making something up. Um, you may want a somewhat custom platform or you know, one you buy that you may maybe heavily modify um, to uh, meet your particular use case. Um, so you know, th there's always a question there, but I think bias towards buy and make people force you to build with good reasons would be the advice. Yeah, thank you. Guys, to give uh, the kill of, kill of time uh, to everyone, uh, we're going to run it like for one hour. So we have like 10 more minutes. Uh, yeah. Aaron, I, I, I want to call out, somebody brought up Boring Technology Club. And that <laughs> is, you know, it, 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 in my company, we go, we live by that. Like, what is the most boring technology you can do to use a thing? So uh, David, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, there, there is one just to kind of everybody should be reading that. That's uh, one of my favorite resources. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And uh, we'll move uh, forward to the next question. Question is: Once your platform is well established and devs building on uh, on it find it good enough, uh, how do you get them to continue giving your you feedback on how to improve the platform? It seems that once they can deploy code. Uh, it's harder to get them to look away from uh, from that to give feedback. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's never a static thing, right? I mean, I mean, the, the, the trite answer is technology changes, so you're gonna have new things that come in. Um, but there is some truth to that, right? You know, I've you know seen you know the needs of a platform evolve. So we use Vercel um, as our kind of platform, and there, there's always new things coming in from that such as, okay, we want to do server-side rendering by default um, for certain cases in, in an XJS app. Um, and maybe there's capabilities to make that easier over time. Uh, they give me more capabilities. Um, you know, there's always new kinds of backend capabilities you can bring into a platform to make it easier. Um, so for example, um, you know, if we were building what we're building five years ago, we probably would have just done a simple you know, document store on the backend from one of the core cloud providers. Um, we would have probably had to worry about, uh, you know, certain kind of tenant concerns uh, with that particular way that we would have done that solution. Today, we use Fauna DB. We have a nice serverless backend that we don't ever worry about, uh, you know, even tenancy concerns at this point because it's all kind of handled on the backend for us. It also has better unit economics. Um, sometimes 
you know, if the feature is set for the developers, it happens to be exactly what they need for the next 10 years. Good. I might focus on other things. I might call up some of the, you know, there's probably things I can do to manage costs down, right? Some of those other concerns are great. You know, if you come in with a platform that you're meeting all the developer needs or you're meeting them all pretty well in a good enough way, uh, you're going to make really good friends with your CFO if you can bring down your unit economics or your cost to serve for your organization. Um, that, you know, adding to profitability, nobody's going to fire you for that. You know, the, the, it could be a good opportunity to add a lot of value. Um, making it more secure over time, making it easier to be secure by default so that security doesn't become a burden on your engineers. There's always work to do there. I think, you know, if we think we're done with that, okay, great. I hope your all of your uh, dependencies are always updated. All your patching is always perfect. Um, and if it's not, um, or if it's, um, you know, not quite up to what you need to pass a stock to audit, right? You know, there's always things you can do there as well. Um, so, but if somebody does find, the perfect platform that needs no more work, please let me know. And I will write a check to invest in it. Um, you know, I'm here. Uh, my email was on the thing earlier. <laughs> Great one. Uh, what's your stance towards uh, lead agile system, DevOps, organizational coaches and trainers? Organization, so can, can you do the question again? What's my... For organizational like, uh, what's your point of view on like lead agile system DevOps organizational trainers per se? Like how so, you want, I guess. I love lean and agile. Um, though sometimes I think you know we've been talking about lean and agile so long that uh, I think agile, if it were agile, is so old it can drive. I think it's old enough to vote in the U.S. Um, but I think the trainer idea. I I'm a little sometimes skeptical in theory at least, because I think to do this well, you must practice over time and you must, um, training isn't a one-time event. Training is, it's more like, it'd be like saying, I'm gonna train to learn Portuguese. Well, I need to learn Portuguese over time. I need to be immersed in it. I need to, or this could go for any language or any kind of really you know tough skill to develop. So I think if you're gonna do it, I've seen some organizations do it well, where it's, they hire a coach, that coach is immersed in that team and that coach is immersed in that team and owns outcomes with that team. Um, so, you know, there's coaches for any number of things where, like, I'm going to use a you know, sports analogy. If I'm a soccer coach, my, you know, literal, you know, success metric is, are they more successful? Do they win more games? Um, I think if you're going to have that kind of thing, you should make sure they're aligned in terms of metrics. The anti-pattern with those are, we hired a agile trainer or a DevOps trainer or something for two weeks. Uh, we learned some buzzwords, we go away and then nothing changes. Um, so there, there is an effectiveness argument to be made, uh, but I'm not gonna argue you should never do it or always do it. It's largely how effective is it? Um, and um, are they bringing in contextual advice and not just cargo coal best practices? Yeah. How do you get a feel for the level of developers' cognitive load? Uh, feels like a tricky one to measure. So that's why the Gemba walk idea is so important. You know, walking with the developer and understanding how many things do they have to remember when they're doing a deployment. One of the things people loved about Heroku back in the day uh, was you could just, you know, you didn't have to think about it. You deployed and, and app is up. You didn't think. Whereas, you know, on some more complex platforms, sometimes there are seven or eight different things or decisions that you're making along the way to getting something in production. The more things you have to think about, the more decisions you have to make. Uh, you know, there's the old story about why did Steve Jobs wear a black turtleneck every day? It wasn't because he loved that as a uniform. Maybe he did, but he wanted one less decision to make every day. And so he just wore the same clothes. Um, the fewer decisions you force a developer to make that aren't about should I deploy this or not? Should I merge this into main or not? Um, the more effective they're gonna be from that standpoint, just because you're helping them focus on the things that do matter. All of us humans are fallible, right? You know, there's only so many things we can think about at once. And the things I want to be thinking about when I'm developing products are, is this performant? Does this have the features that my customer needs? How are they using the thing? Um, are they you know, rage clicking out of it when it doesn't work, right? That's what I want to occupy my brain. I don't want this Kubernetes operator do what I thought it would do. 
you know, somebody should think about that. The author of the Kubernetes operator should, <laughs> but that's not what I want to think about when I'm doing product development. And that's really what I'm trying to do with platform work is help engineers focus on things that matter a little bit less on the things like, I don't want to, I don't want you have to think about DNS. You know, if you have to think about DNS, um, my heart goes out to you. Um, something's gone wrong. Uh, sometimes you have to, sometimes it breaks, but hopefully you don't have to think about that every day. I don't, I don't know, we need another uh, webinar schedule. People love you. I have like uh, five more questions, but like three minutes. Let, let's uh, take one and then for the others, um, can we agree that I'll post the questions in Platform Engineering Slack channel and Aaron can answer over yeah. there? I'm about three hours sleep. So if I don't answer them well, I'll try to get to them in the next 12 hours. But uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be there and I'll try to do as many as I can. All for you guys, you see. <laughs> uh, so last question, milestones you would set for an internal development platform from MVP to adoption. So when I've built these, I wanted to get something up and running in eight weeks that allowed you as a um, you know, service team to have something up and prod um, within, you know, from the time that you imagine your Hello World app to the time it goes into prod in something less than a week. Now, that's easy for me to say, and this was even in a pretty complex environment. It was a pretty ambitious goal, but that, that to me would be the, an initial standard uh, for what I'd like to see from a platform. Um, I think you have a big risk if you spend a year building a platform and get no customer feedback. Uh, and this goes back to the same way I think about building a startup. Um, when we raised money for our startup, we had a product ready to go. We had customers um, in our first six weeks. Um, and that's really important because if you're not using actual usage of the product, if you're just using what people, you know, kind of just getting, you know, well, they said they want these five things, so we're going to spend a year building it. You're not really getting customer feedback and uh, in a timely manner, and you might spend a year building the wrong thing. So uh, buy a sword sooner. Um, less than eight weeks to get something out the door is what I would strongly recommend. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys, for being uh, an amazing audience. Uh, you were so, so active. We had so much fun with Aaron. Um, we'll send a follow-up email tomorrow with the webinar recording with the slides from Aaron, as well as a couple of useful links. And um, thank you so much for being here with us today. And uh, subscribe to our Platform Engineering YouTube channel. There are more webinars to come and we'll definitely schedule the next one with Aaron. So Thank you. I loved all the questions and uh, I'll see y'all in the Slack uh, in the future. Cheers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.